Hello, please let me see your ticket stubs for the Double Edge Double Bill. This week, Blumhouse shoots Fancy Island on a cam. Each week, Adam Thomas and Thomas Mariani will come to the table to discuss the randomly selected yin yang of a double feature. Then, both will have to pick number between 1 and 10 in order to seal their fates for the next episode. When we'll have two good movies, the other two bad ones. Let the chaos begin. I am Thomas Mariani here to fulfill all of your fantasies within reason. I have my limits. But I should mention here at the top that uh, one of our co hosts is not here this week. Uh, Adam had some uh, last minute work commitments that prevented him from coming on to the show, unfortunately. Um, he should be on next week. That's the plan, anyway. And we hope he's doing well out there with uh, the work stuff he had to do last minute. But uh, luckily, we had a guest lined up for this and a guest who I'm so happy to have back on. Uh, she's a big horror aficionado in general, and she's got her experiences with writing and podcasting, all sorts of great stuff. Miss Jessica Scott, at least I think you're the real Jessica Scott, not a duplicate of some sort. <laughs> Who can tell at this point, honestly? I'm not sure myself, so I guess we'll find out at some point. We'll, we'll find out, yes. We'll see. Uh, but Jessica, uh, we invite you back on the show, especially for the spooky season, as we love doing <laughs> a horror episodes all throughout October. And you immediately jumped on to Blumhouse as a topic, which we're doing because uh, we're putting this out the week Halloween Ends is coming out, and we're all very, very sad that we'll never see Michael Myers again. It's it's ending. It's completely kaput. Ending over. Never see any of those characters again, ever. So sad. No. no. Uh, R.I.P. to a real one, Michael Myers, uh, <laughs> who has not died multiple times at all. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, uh, Halloween is one of the many big sort of franchises that Blumhouse has become a big part of, obviously. Uh, Blumhouse started in uh, 2000 uh, from producer Jason Blum and Amy Israel, uh, created the company in 2000. An interesting fact that Israel left the company in 2002, uh, but she's currently the big executive vice president for uh, scripted programming over at Showtime. So she's like the one responsible for like billions and masters of sex being a thing. So any of the good Showtime shows you liked recently, it's all on her. Uh, but, uh, obviously Jason Blum is more of sort of the figurehead of Blumhouse, given he's in the name, and around the time, like, Paranormal Activity was sort of the start of Blumhouse becoming a major sort of player in the horror world in particular, and that started, like, also Insidious and The Purge becoming a thing. Those were big, massive franchises for them. The big thing with Blumhouse is always that, like, they spend very little on their budgets for a big return, uh, because the average Blumhouse production budget is $6.7 million, and the total box office gross as of this recording for Blumhouse releases is $5.06 billion. Wild. Wild, indeed, yes. And they're also very prestigious in their own way, with uh, three mm -hmm. Best Picture nominees, Whiplash, Get Out, Black Klansman. So Jason Blum has been very successful, though... We should probably also point out um, some interesting practices uh, behind the scenes and also his words on Twitter show that uh, he has uh, some some weird ideas that we don't necessarily agree with. Yeah, that's that's one way to put it. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I think in particular, he's not uh, he doesn't treat the people who work for him well based on his own words. Um, he, you know, through the writer and director of 2019's Black Christmas Under the Bus, uh, when a certain faction of the horror crowd uh got upset that someone put a, a political message in a horror movie especially black christmas that's so unlike the original movie yeah completely. <laughs> oh yeah the original the 74 version had absolutely no political message no feminist undertones at all not at all so no. not at all yeah and you know he famously said that you know there are no female horror directors no women want to direct horror when Obvious. You know, any horror fan can name dozens off the top of their head. And he has also said that he has to write himself little reminder notes not to verbally abuse his staff. So uh, Blumhouse as a whole puts out some good movies, but it sounds like working for Jason Blum might not be the best job out there. So especially if you're a woman sounds like <laughs> yeah it sounds like he definitely has uh, a lot of issues um but at the same time i i do agree that like, there is still like some very fascinating like directors and writers who at least we mm -hmm. as of right now we don't know are pieces of shit 
quite frankly, uh, who came up in the <laughs> world of uh, Blumhouse with, like, you know, Jordan Peele wouldn't be where he is without that, Mike Flanagan, like, big directors in the horror community. I'm curious, what do you feel about sort of, like, the Blumhouse style? How, what do you think that's contributed to, especially, like, mainstream horror? It's hard for me to put a finger on it because, as you say, they don't have huge budgets, but there's a slickness to them that feels pretty standard even because maybe that's because i cover a lot of indie horror where things are grittier and more diy and there's um some charm in them being rough around the edges but there's just a slickness to a lot of the movies um to the aesthetics um that sticks out to me with blumhouse it's uh i'm being a terrible podcast guest right now it's kind of i, I can't describe it but i can point it out when i see it yeah, I, I think what's interesting with Blumhouse is they kind of get lumped in with a lot of, like, uh, the, the other current modern horror trends, even though I would argue Blumhouse kind of started them. Like, even if you look up either A24 or Blumhouse horror movies, you will get the other ones, fil like, films yes. <laughs> like put in there. The, the, like Those lines are often kind of blurred. I think with Blumhouse, I think it's an interesting kind of uh, look at, like, what sort of modern, especially, like, sort of, like, mainstream cinema is with, like, Blumhouse makes these, like, smaller movies, but I think it's only because, like, Jason Blum has managed to create at least an interesting sort of uh, production factory, as it were, of these low-budget movies, where, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. in, in a modern cinematic landscape where, like, the mid-budget movie has died, like, really, the big kings are people who make $200 million budget movies, and Jason Blum, who, like, the highest budgets are for, like, one of those Blumhouse movies are, like, $20 million or something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's what's fascinating, is that he's definitely become, like, sort of the king of pseudo-indie, I guess you could say. Because, like, oh, it's low budget, but it's, like, they're not really indie movies. Because right. you'll get, like, right, hey, exactly. we'll have, like, one star in here, like, Lena Headey just started that Game of Thrones show, but she'll be in our Purge movie with Ethan <laughs> Hawke. <laughs> um but what sort of drew you i guess then to blumhouse as a topic amongst all the other horror topics we had what, what do you think is like fascinating about them in general part of it is me not always knowing distributors or production companies um and part of it is kind of that blurring the lines you referred to i could not remember everything that blumhouse put out so when i looked up everything that they put out i mean there are some misses i would argue in there but on the whole there are so many damn good horror movies that they've put out i just thought it would be interesting to talk about them because there's so much to cover because they really do have some of my favorite movies of the past decade at least in the horror genre yeah i remember when i got my start in horror podcasting it was about like a decade ago or so when blumhouse was sort of mm -hmm. on the rise especially in like the horror section of it so i remember mm -hmm. like going to like most of the major bone house releases and just noticing then what i think is still very true now which is that unlike other like say an a24 where their output is much more sort of like quality over quantity uh blumhouse is mm -hmm. much more it's hey we're gonna put out what the fuck ever and it results in i would say <laughs> the fair thing is a mixed bag at the very least and it, yes yes right and especially over various different platforms like we're recording this like right after there was a blumhouse movie i found out that was just dumped on netflix this last week from the blindside director john lee hancock the one with um donald sutherland and the kid from it oh mr harrigan's phone yes, yes. right that that was just uh -huh. recently i had no idea that was a thing <laughs> <laughs> until I was like on Netflix watching one of the movies we're talking about today. Uh, that's another thing is like they were big progenitors of just like we'll put some stuff in theaters, put some stuff on streaming. They were very much like a you know everything must go sale. We have to like put it out there like a spirit <laughs> Halloween store in that way. Just like it's all gonna go. But we'll be talking about two uh, very different films in uh, sort of their release schedule, which every week uh, Adam and I usually cover a good and a bad pick we pick at the end of the previous episode. And uh, we end up with, uh, first we'll discuss his bad pick of Fantasy Island, um, and then uh, yes. my good pick, which was Cam. Uh, so let's go ahead and start mm -hmm. then with Fantasy Island. Good evening. I'm Mr. Rurik. Let me officially welcome you to Fantasy Island. I'm curious how this all works. What if your fantasy involves a person from your life? Holograms, like Tupac. What if it's somebody who died? Tupac. So, what's your fantasy? Revenge on a childhood bully. Your life is about to change. I hope you're ready. That is a really good hologram. There is only one fantasy per guest. And you must see your fantasy through. It brought her back to life. No matter what. 
The island's twisting what we asked for. <laughs> So Fantasy Island came out uh, February 14th, 2020. One of the few theatrical releases of 2020 uh, came out about a month before uh, the COVID pandemic hit. So I guess it technically, I think, makes like one of the top 20 grocers of that year on a technicality. (laughs) (laughs) Right, exactly. Big asterisk in there. (laughs) Right, massive asterisk, yeah. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) But um, this is uh, from Jeff Wadlow, uh, who was a co-writer and director on this, based on the TV series... Uh, which ran from 1977 to 1984, uh, starring Ricardo Montalban and Hervé Villachez, uh, which I guess we should establish firmly up here. Do you have any, like, cultural memory of Fantasy Island, like the actual TV show? Oh, I grew up hearing the plane, the plane. You know, like, that was a running right. joke in pop culture, you know, and kind of Fantasy Island was kind of... I absorbed through cultural osmosis what it was all about and had a vague idea of it but i've never actually seen the show because it went off the air when i was still an infant uh there's kind of a a weird lapse in pop culture where i grew up on nick at night watching 50s and 60s sitcom reruns but there's a lot of stuff from the 70s to very early 80s that i didn't see because they weren't in reruns yet and they weren't new for me either so fantasy island was one of those shows that kind of fell into that limbo and i never actually watched yeah i'm definitely with you in terms of i only know the show through pop culture osmosis with like the hervey villages character or even the biggest thing i realized was the um looney tunes package movie daffy duck's fantastic island are you aware of this at all (laughs) i am not so in the 80s the looney tunes uh were like in a desperate state so like how about we put out these package movies where it'll be a collection of shorts that are like wrapped around this new animation that we'll do um to like Mm. connect them together basically so it was like daffy duck was the ricardo montalban stand-in speedy gonzalez was the tattoo stand-in such a great cultural thing to do (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> on so many levels um but yeah most of what i know because like that established everything that apparently is in the show which is like a person will come onto the island and mr Rourke will say welcome to fantasy island go to this wishing well put your coin in the well and then you get whatever your fantasy to come true and uh that was apparently at least the general idea with uh, the fantasy island show where they'd have guest stars come on and stuff like that and so um mm-hmm. for some reason uh, Blumhouse and uh, Sony were like, hey, let's p- make a big theatrical horror movie out of this concept. It's just like, you know, like a Tales from the Crypt, like, be careful what you wish for kind of thing. Right. Where we have a group mm-hmm. of people come onto the island and they all have their own individual fantasies, but those fantasies don't turn out as they planned, only on the show where it was just like, oh, well, I guess that wouldn't have worked out. It's like, it won't work out and you'll fucking die. <laughs> You're going to fucking die on <laughs> Fantasy Island, I guess is the pitch. I honestly really like that pitch. I think I'm a big fan of wacky, you know, what if we took, I I just think it's such a bizarre idea. Let's take this, you know, beloved TV show about fantasies and turn it into a horror story. I, I'm obsessed with that idea. I really wanted it to work. I've seen this movie a couple of times now and every time I root for it to work because I think it's so strange and silly that it just has to work despite itself and yet (laughs) right yes and yet Uh, i had not seen this movie before adam picked it on the previous episode and um i agree with you that i kind of like that idea because like i'm a big fan like tales from the crypt anthology shows Mm -hmm, so like mm -hmm. i love the idea of like oh like it's a be careful what you wish for story that can result in great horror and stuff like that um the trouble is with fantasy island um how do i put into words uh it's, it's fucking bad it's really bad, <laughs> awful movie <laughs> that just doesn't work with like, because it's so totally all over the place. Because you get like everybody coming onto the island, and mm-hmm. um, you you have like these various different people. You have Lucy Hale with her fantasy of just like, oh, I want to completely destroy my high school bully. Um, you've got Austin Stowell as this uh, cop who's like, oh, I wish I would have uh, joined the Marines, or I wish I would have joined the Army and could have, you know, made my dad proud, which he ends up having that fantasy. Mm-hmm. He's like, oh, no, I met my dad. Oh, no. What a twist in the jungles. <laughs> I'm, I'm like in Vietnam, basically. Um, and then there's like a couple brothers played by Jimmy O. Yang and Ryan Hansen. Want to have like the best party possible and we're going to be bros together forever, like literal and figurative bros. And like, all those stories result in such diametrically bizarre, like, storylines 
that they so ham-fistedly try and connect to each other. And it's so, like, this feels weirdly, despite the fact that it's a $7 million movie, um, it feels extremely studio-noted. Like, this feels like a Frankenstein oh, movie. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Yeah, I. you mentioned anthology horror. I feel like it could have worked better had we just um, segmented them off where you don't have those tones competing with each other so much because this is such a convoluted movie. I've seen it twice and I still had to Google the plot just to make sure I had it straight because it goes off in such bizarre twists and turns and not in a satisfying way, not in a, oh, damn, that's they got me. No, just really bizarre twists and turns that you really need a flow chart to follow it um and yeah you've got like maggie q has this really melancholy storyline where she you know she turned down the love of her life and they were supposed to get married and have a kid together <sighs> there are so many good actors in this movie there and one reason i always root for it is i love a lot of the people involved i ryan hansen is probably my favorite hollywood douche right now because <laughs> i he plays that character so well and he's so likable at it and i love maggie hugh i think michael pena is one of the funniest people working today and he gets to play with that a little bit but he mostly is just a guy in a suit for most of the movie through no fault of his own i think and, you know, Michael Rooker, I think most genre fans really love Michael Rooker, but he doesn't, again, have that much to work with. And we've got all these different energies and plot lines competing with each other, where it's just, as you said, it's a Frankenstein of a movie. It's just this monstrous lumbering thing that you're trying to follow all the plot twists. And then you're just like, oh, OK, so that's that's what's happening. Well, that I'm glad I spent, you know, 109 minutes of my life on that. <laughs> yeah it, it, like especially with you know you mentioned some of the people like rooker like that feels more like such a massive tease for any genre fan just like mm -hmm. oh it's michael rooker mm -hmm. popping up and it's literally like him he'll pop up just so <laughs> randomly it's just like oh i've been on the island for so long how's everybody doing all right bye and then it'll be like <laughs> another 15 minutes and then he'll show up again and mm -hmm. then another 15 minutes later he gets killed and it's just like, yes. like you're getting michael rooker here with this like fucking redneck doc brown oh, wig that he's got yeah. on. <laughs> so bad. And so like bad. putting him around on this island, like for just random plot contrivance, just like, oh, let me help out these two ladies get out of here. And then right. get, like fall off this cliff and get murdered and shit like that. Just like it's such and I love Michael Pena as well. I think like in the Ant Man yes. movies and stuff like that, he's such a fun actor. And here he's very much like in a weird state of like because he's filling the shoes of like Ricardo Montalban. One of the most charming actors possible. Yes. Like, most of what I know about, like, Fantasy Island is him, like, on the beach, like, welcome to Fantasy Island. It's like, right, yeah, exactly. I would feel welcome if Ricardo Montalban said that to me. Or Michael exactly. Pena. If Michael Pena got to be, like, Ricardo Montalban style, like, charming and immediately inviting me, just like, fuck yeah, sure, it's Pena. He looks asleep in this movie, and it's such a shame. <laughs> It is. Yeah. Cause like he's so talented and he's got such a cool energy and yeah, he's got that charisma if they would let him turn it on. And Rooker is such a really good actor when he's given the chance to like dig into a role and like work with like, a really good script, but that is not what anybody in this movie got here. No. Yeah. Cause like Rooker is one of many things where it's just like, Oh, let's somehow connect these various threads because all the like initially mm -hmm. for the first half of the movie the various different like fantasies are happening simultaneously and they'll occasionally intersect with weird things like there's a point where jimmy o yang like shoots off a grenade into the fucking water it's like woo we're having a party me ryan hands it's so cool and then you have like <laughs> it literally cuts over to like some fucking platoon shit with Austin Stowell <laughs> and his dad going off on this like Vietnam journey and just like this guys these transitions are fucking terrible this this is like right? this is like I, it's such a mood whiplash to the point where like I might sue for like neck damage of the mood and whiplash. you would win yeah, yeah. <laughs> like and L Lucy Hale it's like zombie torture porn it feels like right. a hostile movie her storyline right with the big fucking beefy doctor dude who yes, just comes into yeah. I'm gonna torture Portia double day like where is this? <laughs> It, God, it's it's so many movies crammed into one, and I'm I really would like to know what the thought process is behind it, because again, it's a good idea, and maybe if it had been an actual anthology where it's like, here's the hostel version, here's you know a big giant party at a mansion that goes south, but not with you know a drug cartel and hand grenades and things like that, and and Kim Coates. <laughs> 
You, oh my god you talk about wasting people oh yes. kim coates is so good too and then he shows up just to be a generic baddie with a gun oh my god like i, th- I think that's what bothers me so much is they had a lot of talent in front of the camera and i'm sure behind of course as well but like it's just it's such a waste of a good idea it's such a waste of good people and again i i will probably watch this movie again because it's i kind of i find it kind of fascinating but i will never remember all the intricacies of the plot no matter how many times i watch it maybe that's the problem is that it's so like becomes unmemorable that you eternal sunshine it from your mind and then you're like maybe, <laughs> Probably. Oh, maybe this is good maybe no maybe it's actually good but you just forgot all like no it's not that good um, yeah i think that's what happened yeah there are so many points in this movie where like they come back together and they're like oh my god What's going on on this island? Wait a minute. There's that one lady who's on the island <laughs> who's probably Mr. Rourke's wife. Oh my god, that makes so much sense. And then that like leads to this and this. It's these fucking characters just like making these massive leaps about like, I what know. the fuck's happening. <laughs> like how I would never have figured that out. And clearly we're all here for a reason. We're all part of someone else's fantasy. God, my goodness. And, and, and they're noticeably all these scenes are like take place in front of like a weird like either rock formation or waterfall <laughs> that doesn't look anything like the rest of the actual island but in Fiji <sighs> like it's just like clearly mm-hmm. reshoot weird shit that's just like oh we, this doesn't fucking work at all we gotta connect these storylines together and then when they ultimately do connect the storylines it's in this bizarre package that has like a hat on top of a hat reveals where it's like oh my god we were all in the same apartment complex when a big fire raged out and this one guy mm-hmm. died who was like the uh, roommate of the two brother characters and uh the austin so well could have saved that guy but didn't and maggie q caused the fire and mm-hmm. then noticeably the sweatiest thing is lucy hale just like oh i was supposed to go on a date with that guy but i stood him up and it's like hmm that doesn't <laughs> seem like you should be that right. guilty about this i wonder if there's some kind of ulterior motive to your character mm-hmm. <laughs> to some degree <laughs> Oh my god. And I, I almost, when we find out that actually Lucy Hale is out for revenge, but not for the original revenge, or it was just an icing on the cake, like she's like, let me, you know, screw over this girl who bullied me and then get my other revenge. I almost want to respect it because it's so bonkers. Like, here's my red herring revenge plot and here's my real revenge plot. But it it doesn't work because we already had such a busy, convoluted movie already. I think if it had made more sense and been more cohesive and then it was like, psych, I have two revenge plots going. I would have admired that just for the the audacity of it. Yeah, because I think what they want to do is something like, say, one of my favorite examples of something like that is like Scream 4 with Emma Roberts' character. Mm-hmm. Like one of my favorite examples, just like, we're going to go fucking wild with the last like <laughs> 20, 30 minutes of this movie that was just kind of like a yes. traditional scream movie before this point. Versus mm-hmm. like, yeah, this movie is so convoluted. Like you don't have any kind of base in whatever the reality uh-huh. of Fantasy Island is. So then when things are weirdly subverted like this, you're like, what? What? <laughs> what? This? Yeah. I need this to be like, you're not subverting anything. It's just like you're adding, another, once again, it's like a hat and a hat to the point where mm-hmm. this movie is a hat wreck. It's just too many different hats <laughs> on one fucking thing. It's just like, I don't know what this is supposed to be. Who has this many hats? Exactly. Exactly. It's it's so bizarre. And like it's it's like you said, like I could in theory like the idea of like a fantasy island movie where you have like Michael Pena as your sort of crypt keeper that's just like, mm-hmm. oh like here's this fantasy, like maybe it'll work out for you. Oh no, it didn't. Twist. <laughs> anyway, let's move on to the next thing. But yeah, they have right. to like really shoehorn together this bizarre like plot where like with with that element of like lacking the reality that we're talking about who the fuck are these like extra characters that pop up in the other fantasies are they they're like initially we're thinking oh are they actors and it's like oh no they're like weird monster mutations who when they bleed it's like black blood and then their eyes just like burst and they're like crying black blood tears like what 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 is this <laughs> i'm gonna have to watch it another seven or eight more times to be able to explain that to you I I've gotten nothing like <laughs> it's there's just too many ideas like there's they want to have ghosts and zombies and you know this kind of monkey's paw revenge story all mashed together plus like a lost thing going on with a, a mysterious island with a mysterious power at the center that nobody really can explain it's they've just they're trying to do too many sci-fi and horror things at the same time yeah, down to especially, like, Mr. Rourke's whole thing is like, oh, I have to stay on the island and fulfill the fantasies because I want to keep my wife alive. Mm-hmm. And then the wife is just like, no, you shouldn't do that. And he's like, you're right, I shouldn't. Bye, <laughs> wife. 
but then he's like, now I'm gonna stay anyway. <laughs> yeah, because I like it here. Yeah, because <laughs> you know what? Hey, it's Fiji. It looks right. This place looks great. You're like, come on, why right? Not? Um, and leading into the fucking twist slash like fan service bit of this movie <sighs> that is like. Yeah. Like one of the most baffling things, where um, at the end Jimmy O Yang's character, like after uh, Ryan Hansen gets killed, all of a sudden he's like, "No, not my bro!" And then he's like super sad about it, and he's like, "Well, you didn't actually have a fantasy fulfilled, so you can wish for whatever you want." And he's like, "I want my brother to survive. I want him to be alive." It's like, but if you do that, you have to stay on the island forever. I'm willing to sacrifice that. So Ryan Hansen shows up in the fucking. <laughs> airplane implying <laughs> so many things like is that like a horrible murder version of ryan hansen's gonna like kill their parents or something <laughs> like what's <laughs> what are the implications of that and then of course jimmy o yang has been teasing this whole time about like oh everybody calls me t because of a bad tattoo i got i got i was dared to do the dumbest tattoo possible michael Payne's like let me see it and it says tattoo which was the name of hervé village's character mm-hmm. on the show so this now jimmy o yang is is tattoo yeah he's tattoo just i i would love to have been in the audience when that reveal popped up and just hear the collective groan of everyone who sat through the movie for that reveal like and it can't even oh god because like who was that (laughs) that is one of those like fan servicey things where most people who have not seen fantasy island which is anybody who went to see this movie like any young like right. teen to 20 year old person who's just like i don't know it looks like a fun blumhouse horror movie it's like why do they have this tattoo bit throughout the whole thing is gonna be like nonplussed by it and then anybody exactly. who actually gave a shit about the show is gonna be like what the fuck is this <laughs> what <laughs> exactly nobody was clamoring for that and you're either gonna piss people off or just confuse people and they'll have to google it when they get home like why was he called tattoo that it's when you have to go home and google the joke or google the reference it it's not well done Generally no, yeah. speaking. I mean, yeah. so. <laughs> um, to be fair, Blumhouse is the, one of the few examples where I didn't mind that, which was Split, where most people watching Split to the end and seeing Bruce Willis at the end had no idea who the fuck he was or what Unbreakable was to the degree that I saw that movie in a the theater and I got it and I'm like, holy fuck, that's happening. But everyone else was confused, including one person in front of me who just said, why the fuck is the guy from Die Hard here? <laughs> <laughs> oh wow one of the rare examples of like a oh the ending of split explained videos like that right you right. actually need one of those i get it <laughs> <laughs> oh god what a culture we live in huh yes where we're equalizing <laughs> or remaking things that most audiences have no idea what the fuck they are <laughs> yeah yes true uh like of course mm-hmm. fantasy island um let's go ahead and uh, wrap up here because we have another movie to talk about uh jessica your final thoughts as I guess the person who will spend her life trying to decipher the clues of Fantasy <laughs> Island based on, like, you're going to be the archaeologist, like, Sam Neill in Jurassic Park, just like, what does it mean? Why what does this connect? Mean? <laughs> I, honestly, I'm going to watch this movie again. I can just feel it in my bones. But it is not a good movie. I just keep wanting it to succeed, despite my knowledge that it does not. So maybe my fantasy is for this to be a good movie, but I keep replaying it, and I'm just stuck in a loop. That's the twist. That's Michael Pena's there dark you go. twist. It's just like, <laughs> oh, you want to watch Phoenix Island more and make it good? Well, watch it as much as you can! <laughs> oh, I wish we had Michael Pena doing that. I wish. Me too. Instead of this. I, I will say that, like, this is definitely an example where, like, if it was a more entertainingly baffling movie, it would kind of fit mm. into the sort of train wreck bad that we're, like, talking about on the show. Yeah, it's just like, yeah. if this was more, like, consistently, like, fast, like, what the fuck? Are you doing this now? What? What? <laughs> but the problem is that, like, there are huge stretches in between these weird turns that are just kind of, like, dull and are either, like, you know, a bad comedy with, like, the brother stuff or a mm-hmm. very, like, melodramatic uh, kind of dull with the Maggie Q stuff or right. that weird bad wardrobe. I'm like, I didn't talk about this. The the worst bit of this movie is the bit where fucking Austin Stowell talks to his like fantasy dad about like, <laughs> oh, you know what? I was born four months premature. That's be- <laughs> And you said I was a fighter like Muhammad Ali. <laughs> it's one of the dumbest fucking lines I've heard in a fucking movie. <laughs> in so long uh it's it's one of those where like if it was more of that kind of bizarre badness i would at least say like this is fascinating to decipher and i could get being like an archaeologist of fantasy island <laughs> but uh, at the same time this one is just like it's not 
nearly engaging enough to justify that kind of thing. But at the same time, I do agree with you about I'm all on board for like if you're going to do a weird IP research, it's like, oh, let's remake this. Have a fun weird genre spin on it. Like I know the the Banana Splits movie wasn't one that a lot of people loved, but I like that idea. Of like we own this property, we're gonna do something with it. How about we make it a weird horror movie or some bullshit? <laughs> sure. Right, <laughs> right. That could go either way. Uh, in this case, it did not go very well. No, no. But now uh, let's talk about our next film, Cam. I love this song. I slit my throat last night. Holy shit! What are you looking at? Nothing. She's texting a boy. Alice. I'm gonna tell her. My rank needs to be better. I'm like this. Close to breaking top 50. I can taste it. Customer support. How can I help you? Hi. I'm locked out of my account. I think you guys are just replaying an old show or something. I don't think that's possible. We can't do that. Okay. Well, does it say my channel is live? Yes, ma'am. Hey, we have a new friend. That person is not me. She looks exactly like you. Weird. Who is she? Unexpected things happen to test us. It isn't safe. What is it? I've watched enough to guess who it'll choose. But I don't know what it is. You stole my face and now I'm going to get it back. You stole my face and now I'm going to get it back. Let's have some fun. So uh, Cam uh, came out November 16th, 2018 uh, from uh, director Daniel Goldhopper and uh, writer Isa Mazaya. I apologize if I mispronounced that, either of those names, quite frankly. This is a horror film about a cam girl, and uh, the screenwriter herself was a former cam girl and drew upon her experiences to make this movie, uh, which is about um, Alice, who uh, makes her living as a cam girl um, and uh, has been doing pretty well at it and is trying to rise up the ranks. But uh, she ends up uh, getting her identity stolen uh, by an exact copy of her that is, like, doing the cam show on her own and is, like, clearly live. And it's this interesting sort of twist on sort of, like, an identity theft story, as it were, to some extent. And uh, this was my good pick. And I am personally uh, thought this is an underrated of the Blumhouse movies. I thought it was a really interesting exploration, especially of... A sort of sect of sex work that I don't think gets a lot of play in a lot of horror movies. And mm-hmm. it's a movie where, at least to me, I feel it does a pretty good job of not playing the sex work in like a negative light. As much as just like people's perceptions of it and ultimately, you know, the idea of getting your identity stolen, which is more of like an internet in general fear mm-hmm. and phobia. Um, yeah. But I am curious, uh, just because you kind of hinted uh, to me earlier that uh, this was a bit harsher for you to watch. It was. Um, I uh, this was very stressful for me to watch, and I, I, that sounds silly to say about because horror movies generally are stressful. But um, it it kind of I sometimes have to uh, pause and catch my breath during horror movies if it's too scary or if it's too intense or if it's hitting too close to home or whatever. And all of Alice's interactions with men in the real world. Uh, were so so difficult for me to watch that I would kind of have to pause and take a breather after every scene because I have started doing when I log a film on Letterboxd after I watch it I will sometimes skim uh, the reviews which I admit is probably a mistake on my part but um, I saw a lot of people asking why would she go right back into camming after the horrible experience she had like she sets up a new account at the end of the movie and just tries to start over again uh one of the many things this film does really well i think is um show that as much as the internet can kind of be the wild west where you're not protected you're very vulnerable you can have your identity stolen you can receive abuse a lot of terrible things can happen to you online being in the real world with men is even worse Um, because when she goes to the police and tells them someone has stolen my identity they are stealing my livelihood Uh, I need you to help me get rid of this person who is pretending to be me and stealing my money the cops don't believe her they don't think it's serious and when another cop has to leave the room to take a call the second officer both of them are men he's very sexually threatening I was fully expecting him to attempt to assault her. And I think had his partner been out of the room for longer, he would have done that. Um, But he's asking her really 
disgusting condescending questions like what's the weirdest thing you've ever had to do do you meet up with guys to have sex and when she responds in the negative he says oh that's a shame like he's very sexually aggressive with her when he's supposed to be there you know uh as a cop allegedly there to serve and protect he's supposed to be there to help her but he's just acting like he wants to assault her and take advantage of her because she is so vulnerable um when she goes to her brother's birthday party her brother's friends are watching videos of her and you know making fun of her for doing porn making fun of her brother for having a sister who does porn and the little brat who watches the video and shares it with everyone Mm. is is threatening with her is like really aggressive with her and like he's very condescending like he thinks he's better than her but he also wants her sexually it's a really scary combination um and when she meets up uh barney i think it's barnacle bob is the the big whale on the website he tips the most um when he starts uh tipping alice instead of another performer um there's kind of a rivalry that starts up because he tips the most and if you can get on his good side you can move up in the rankings she meets up with him in person but when they she runs to the bathroom, her doppelganger starts up a live feed and he becomes angry that he thinks the real Alice is trying to scam him. He busts in on her in the bathroom and physically assaults her and pretends that she's his wife and he starts dragging her away to sexually assault her. Like every man she meets in the real world tries to physically harm her or clearly has intentions to physically harm her it is a very very scary movie to watch um for anyone who's ever done sex work regardless of gender for for women um who uh, you know I can't speak for every woman in the world but I'd be willing to bet this is a pretty universal experience dealing with sexual assault or people who uh, if they had just one more minute of opportunity would be sexually assaulting you like it's really uh, kind of traumatic to watch and know how vulnerable she is and how she because of because of just misogyny and patriarchy and the horrible stigma against sex work how vulnerable she is she has no one who wants to help her everybody just wants to look down on her and take advantage of her physically or otherwise and it's just it's really really hard to watch at times so that's why i had so much trouble with it yeah and i i I said this before we started recording but i do apologize for you know getting you into that particular situation (laughs) no you're fine this yeah yeah um even though like honestly like when i started watching like oh yeah right i still think personally it's still a very good movie does deal with a lot of traumatic elements despite that and i think it's a major reason because of that is that at the same time that it firmly establishes a lot of these people who look down her because of her sex work. The movie itself does not do that. And I really appreciate no. that with the movie. Like earlier on, they have her do her, like her cam show and she's like very like jovial and she like gets a real like creative burst out of just doing it. She like genuinely wants to do it. She thinks she like really works. She wants to put on like a show in this like very specific space that feels very, you know, private where it's like, it's just her and her specific followers who like pay her tokens and stuff like that, which I love all of the, the, the chat room stuff. Yes, yeah. And this movie's very, with like the, the various bizarre gifts and shit like that that pop up <laughs> here. And it's a real credit to a special uh, Madeline Brewer, uh, which was, this is the first time I noticed her in anything, but she's been in other stuff like Handmaiden's Tale and uh, Orange is the New Black. She was on the first season of. Um, she's really good at firmly establishing like, hey, I'm the sex worker who has certain boundaries. Like she doesn't uh, do nudity. She'll um, <laughs> like, I've, and she'll only do, you know, have a certain amount of, um, things she's willing to do that like people will like mm-hmm. ask her to do on on the uh, in the chat room and stuff like that and i think they do a pretty good job of establishing like she loves doing this and the movie isn't looking down at her despite what other characters might say absolutely no I, I i'm not saying that it's a bad movie because i uh found it difficult to watch i think it's really good and i think it does an excellent job of not judging any of the sex workers um you know obviously having um isa maze again i apologize if i'm mispronouncing her name um but you know since she is writing from real world experience she was able to present it as it is with um knowing exactly what goes into that line of work and not judging people who pursue that line of work which you know if there had been a hint of judgment or condemnation of alice or any of the other cam girls I would not have enjoyed this movie, but I really loved it because 
you know, it's, it's passing judgment on pretty much everyone else, all the people who try to victimize these women or try to take advantage of these women or refuse to help them when they are in trouble. Yeah. And at the same time, I do like the fact that they have um, the, the Alice character, like she has some of these like issues that stem from, I think a lot of that sort of um, societal view of sex work Mm -hmm. with like, she hasn't told her mother about it. And the only person who kind of knows is her brother who is like very supportive privately. But the moment, right. obviously, like you mentioned, like once uh, her identity gets stolen by this mysterious force and like starts putting out her private shows on like, like sort of a Pornhub style rip sites yeah. like that, mm-hmm. um, he immediately becomes like very like upset that like everybody is like judging his sister about this and also that the embarrassment right. he gets about it at the same time. Yeah. And I'm glad that you brought up the artistic side of it because, you know, this is not, she's an artist. This is her job and she is putting on shows. She is a performer. You know, she's putting a lot of creativity into it. You know, she has, you know, different, she does costumes, lighting. She's her own writer, producer, director. She's doing, wearing all these hats, bringing it back to the the hat analogy. (laughs) She's wearing all these hats in what she's But she knows only to use like one hat at a time and doesn't have a whole hat rack on. (laughs) Exactly. She's got the hat rack ready, but she's wearing one hat at a time. No, but like she does everything. She controls everything. And it's that level of control that matters. Like she is in her own place. She is autonomous over what she chooses to do or not do. Like like you said, she has rules. Um, Like she doesn't fake orgasms. She doesn't tell people she loves them. You know, she is very honest she's very you know these, this is my boundary and I'm not going to go past it for money like um I just I really appreciate that they went so far into the artistry of it because I think some people think of sex work as well yeah, I'm not even going to say what other people think because I'm not going to get into what judgmental people think about sex work but she is putting on a show and she's being very creative with it and it's very cool to have a peek into that world before it gets into the more troubling elements where, you know, she's so vulnerable. The lack of privacy and autonomy that comes into the internet horror of it, where her doppelganger is breaking her rules. Like it looks and acts exactly like her, but that doppelganger is doing nudity, is saying, oh, I love you guys. Thank you so much. You know, doing things that she says she's not going to do. It's, um, I like that it kind of marries what happens to sex workers in the real world with what happens to everybody on the internet there's always the chance of having your identity stolen having your persona um, warped and misinterpreted and twisted and taking on a life of its own that you never intended or never wanted like I think that idea of the difference between your real self and your persona is something everybody struggles with if they're online at all Um, And I think it's a really cool interrogation of that. I've heard some people who had issues with the movie were like, oh, I really love the first two thirds until sort of the ending happens Mm -hmm. and sort of the Mm -hmm. resolution for what necessarily is and what this like actual being is or whatever. But I like that we don't know a lot about what this sort of mysterious being is. It can just stand in for, like you mentioned, like any kind of general identity theft. Like even uh, the screenwriter said that she based it on the fact that like someone did steal like her videos and put them that were like private on to mm-hmm. like these sites like we're talking about without her permission to any degree and just that that element of it i think it, it does such a great job with like really escalating that horror too where initially she's like oh is someone playing like an old video of mine i guess on my channel or whatever and then she creates a sock puppet account and signs in and the the other version of her acknowledges like oh hi teapot terrifying <laughs> like what yes. the fuck <laughs> Yes. Yeah. I I love doppelganger horror anyway. Like what is scarier than you, but not you, you know, looking in a mirror and seeing something that's just, just a little bit off. Like I, I find that very terrifying. And the idea of putting that into the internet where you're kind of not sure what's you and what's a role you're playing. And then it gets kind of multiplied like a virus. It's just, it's so fascinating. And I, there's a, there are a lot of internet horror movies out there, but this is the one that I like the best in terms of attacking that particular aspect of what it's life, what, what it's like to live an online life. We mentioned obviously like all this stuff, like, oh, she's breaking all these rules that like the real her wouldn't do this like doppelganger. Like the one where I felt like so bad for her was the, the one where um, the doppelganger goes into the library and does one of those yes. like sneaky yeah. things. Just like, oh, I'm going to uh, masturbate in the library and stuff like that. Something mm-hmm. she would never do that like, yeah. completely violates it. Almost, it feels like it's this weird kind of like extension of like, oh, not only is your identity being stolen, but in a weird way, your own body is being violated. 
Exactly. Way. Yeah. And it's so upsetting to see. It really mm -hmm. makes you empathize with her, this whole situation. It, there's a lot of elements of revenge porn in it mm -hmm. where, you know, they're, t they're violating her body and, you know, spreading videos of her that she would never take herself. And the fact that it, it's only when the doppelganger starts shooting videos that, you know, her brother's friends see it and it starts press spreading and getting out of her control. It's all about controlling your image, your body, who gets access to you and who doesn't. And when she loses control of that because of this malignant outside force, it's such a violation and it, it's so horrifying. That was one of the things that I had so much trouble with because like, especially a woman on the internet, you have fears like that all the time. And the idea of not being able to control it and losing bodily autonomy and personal autonomy, it's just, it's so scary. Yeah, and particularly with another element, we haven't talked about him. You mentioned some of the, the various people she interacts with in real life, but uh, mm -hmm. her sort of number one fan, I guess, as it were, <sighs> Tinker. Yes. Um, which is like uh, this guy that is constantly like trying to like chat with her and message. Like she, they have at least some kind of like collaboration initially where like the, the great opening of this movie with the whole like throat slit is put on by him creating a sock puppet account. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, there's a friendliness there. But at the same time, she has these boundaries that are up about like, okay, you know, we can't do quite like, you know, some of the things he's suggesting. She doesn't want to go that far. But mm -hmm. then as things go along, he starts breaking those boundaries, particularly as he interacts more with the doppelganger. And it's like, oh, I was supposed to come here to your uh, mom's salon. I was, uh, you told me to come here with flowers. Like, oh, oh, fuck. Get out of there. Yeah. Get the fuck out of there. Real credit to, I want to mention, uh, Patch Derrick plays that guy. And he's a dude who I've seen in a ton of things. He's one of those, like, character actors who's perfect at just completely blending into the background. And here he plays the perfect example of this guy who you would initially suspect, like, oh, he might be, like, a nice guy, maybe. But then the moment he interacts with you, just like, I gotta be on my toes. Especially as a woman, I'm sure, like, you've met that guy, unfortunately, many times. Oh, oh, yeah. The the yeah. second he popped up, I was like, he's a capital N, capital G nice guy. Um, yes. He's the guy yes. who, uh, at first, he seems like he might be okay, but he gets way too familiar, way too fast, mm -hmm. and starts uh, feeling proprietary um, and possessive. And it gets very, like, the nice guys are sometimes the scariest guys, because they try to pretend to be something they're not, are usually more emotionally manipulative. Right. Uh, so yeah, yeah. The the nice guy aspect is very realistic for a woman a woman online, and I'm uh, according to some friends of mine who do sex work, they deal with a lot of that. There is so much uh, that goes into that in terms of trying to set boundaries as much as possible and having to do a lot of emotional labor to deal with that kind of thing. The that horrible scene when they're in his uh, motel room because he has moved to Alice's town. He didn't live close to her, but he moved to be close to her. Um, and then when the doppelganger starts doing shows, he claims he wants to save her, but she falls asleep in the motel room and wakes up to him masturbating to the doppelganger. Mm -hmm. It is such a clear delineation of, you know, everyone dehumanizes her. And the, the one guy who claimed he actually cared about her as a person doesn't care that he's basically masturbating to a hologram of her or a sex doll of her he, she's not a human to him she's just you know body parts um and something that he can try to control and possess and it's it's so scary but it's so sad like you never expected him to actually come through for her but when it actually happens it's still so depressing right you would expect this guy to be like definitely a weird kind of creep to some degree but it's like oh no you went over to a yeah. new level of creep dude this is like so yes. fucked up <laughs> that you're doing this yeah uh, but yeah I, I like the fact also that despite i i can see why obviously so many of this stuff can be triggering like the various different encounters she has but i like the fact that it shows the various different levels where it's like there's a temptation a movie like this to have like oh just one specific kind of creep that anybody mm. can be like oh i'm not mm -hmm. that awful therefore any kind of behavior i have is great it's like no this movie shows the various different angles from which sex work can be viewed many of the negative ones but even i like a, a few of the positive ones that show up like when her mother after that horrible revelation at uh the brother's birthday party when they have like the little interaction later on which is like i re i watched a bit of it and i loved how confident you were and you really put a lot of work into it and i'm really like proud that you have this outlet and i wished i could see that more you know, elsewhere. Like, I love the fact that it, they have even a bit of that where it's like somebody can respect what she does genuinely. I loved that moment. And I was, 
I was so jealous in that moment <laughs> that she had a mother who was like very open-minded that she had a, a support system that was very open-minded and very appreciative of all the hard work that she puts into this and all the creativity she puts into this and sees her like actually sees her her mom and I think her brother as well but especially her mom is the only person who sees her as a person outside of some of her fellow cam girls and appreciates what she does and I was just I I this sounds silly but I was legitimately jealous in that moment that she had that support system in her family because i was like yeah some people don't have that yeah i get that yeah and when when her mom because her mom is an esthetician and she does her makeup at the end after she breaks her nose to kind of hide the the bump in her nose now and i was just like that is love and support i loved that so much especially because it kind of obviously not every person uh who does sex work has that but it's not always just you know oh women from broken families and they have no other choice you know it's not a cliche or a stereotype of a sex worker that you see in some other movies right she actually wants to do that and she puts a lot of yeah. effort and a real credit to um goldhaber with like the actual look of the cam shoe like i love the use of color i love the variety particularly even the opening set piece where she does like the fake throat slit and everything like it builds a lot of tension and then the moment she just gets up just like we reached like 53 yeah i can't believe we did it like i I love i love that like element of it how even like the various different looks like even when they go to like the weird like youtube space version of like the cam girl hotel where like they they use the vibatron and shit like that um it's this like a completely different setup that looks like a lot more like almost kind of harsh lighting and feels like you kind of feel her in this sort of desperation to reach this like ranking thing, which I think is like the most negative the movie is about this kind of line of work only because it's like a weird capitalistic rush to be like, I have to be the number one camp girl. Uh Like that's what it is. It's not about sex work. It's just capitalism corrupting cam work. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Yeah. They're fighting for this, you know, again, this really wealthy, old white dude who controls their destinies the you know uh, barnacle bob he's the, he's the big whale who kind of flits from girl to girl depending on how um obedient they are to him and it's all about you know pleasing him to get as much money as possible it's it's definitely an indictment of capitalism for sure oh and the the i felt so bad for her the bit where she reaches 50 and then princess <sighs> x who's the other cam girl who was like getting stuff from barnacle bob is like if she drops 10 ranks I'll go nude for the first time. And yeah. that's and the fact that she has to like that Madeline Brewer has to be like still smiling, like, oh my god, we reached 50. I'm so glad. It's like dropping 53, <laughs> 54. Like, oh, oh it's, that sucks so hard. It's such a shame. <laughs> that like you really feel for her so badly in that moment. Oh yeah, because she's watching her own feed and she's watching Princess's feed and she's watching her rank drop, and like the elation is battling with the need to perform and keep smiling for these guys watching her, but she's also just devastated. It's a really good performance in that moment, and I. But yeah, it it absolutely broke my heart. And I, wait, you mentioned the the Vibatron. That was one of the scariest moments for me because I was so mm-hmm. scared she was going to physically harm herself, and the the desperation on her face, fighting with the okay can i bail because i i I really think i'm gonna hurt myself here like it it, that felt one of the like one of the most exploitative moments not not the film being exploitative but her um uh giving in to more exploitative uh aspects of her job to try to keep going further on that ranking right and i do like at the same time the movie does have occasional bits of like levity in the middle that like during mm-hmm. that sequence like where it's like oh my god it's like she gonna like potentially lose sensation which is like the whole right. thing about the vibratron there's that yeah. bit where like the people who work at like the sort of like youtube space area for cam girls like comes in with two menus like you want sushi or pizza <laughs> <laughs> just off camera <laughs> just adds another layer of like oh no these are like real people who like want to eat after this after like working up like it, it's exhausting it seems pretty yeah. fucking exhausting to do that exactly it's like working a long shift at any job and your co-worker runs up like hey do you want pizza or chinese today you know it's it's a job like anything else <laughs> right yeah it helps really normalize a lot of those elements in a good way oh yeah i, we, I mentioned brewer earlier but her performance especially once the doppelganger element comes in mm. and the subtle differences she has in her character yeah. Like, mm-hmm. works so well where, like, you have, like, just the contrast of the opening scene with the knife and then the scene where, like, she, um, the real version of her is, like, tipping out of, like, bitter anger, but, like, I keep hitting yourself. No, harder, harder, to the point where it's like, oh, hey, you know, guess what? I've got a gun. How about I shoot this off? How much to shoot this off? And she sees herself shoot herself, 
right in front of her. That was, that's one of the great, like, horror moments of this movie, especially when, like, her doppelganger gets up and there's that great, this movie does such a great job with, like, digital artifacting as, like, a horror scheme. Where, like, any time yes. she digitally artifacts as, like, the other duplicate, it's unsettling. Oh, my God. Yeah. It's it's got a, like, the original Pulse kind of vibe to it, where the, the ghosts don't move quite naturally at times. Yeah. And I'm curious, how do you feel about sort of the ending? Because, like I mentioned earlier, I heard some people were, like, not as big on sort of, like, the climax in which she faces off against her doppelganger herself. How do you feel that worked as sort of, like, a big climactic end to the story? Well, I I kind of have mixed feelings because I think it was important for them to face each other, literally face each other. I'm not sure how much I think, how well I think it works. Like, oh, I'm going to trick you into giving me your password. Like, I'm I'm not one usually to be like, excuse me, there's a plot hole, sir. Um, excuse me, I, I have several issues with this film as I detailed here in my forum post. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. I really try not to be that guy. I try to meet a movie where it's at and suspend my disbelief as much as possible, though that sometimes is uh, far more difficult in other situations. But my brain was a little bit like I was disconnecting from the movie a little bit at that point because I was like, I don't know if this works for me. But at the same time, I, I do think that it was vital for them to face each other. And I think it helped a lot seeing the men's reactions to it because they were they were just egging them on and they didn't really question what was happening a lot like a few of them were like does she have a twin is but for the most part they were just there for the spectacle they were just there for the show just to dehumanize two women now instead of one um you know and the fact that they're so into the suicide shows and everything like this this woman is is just a piece of meat for them so i liked that it kind of exposed the men even more as being total trash <laughs> um again i'm kind of torn because i don't know how much i like you know her having to break her nose to make the doppelganger suddenly have a bloody broken nose um and trick her into giving the password but i'd love that they faced off against each other so i don't what do you think i mean i definitely would agree that i think i'm more positive i think than not but i do agree there's some kind of i guess like sort of the logic holes i guess i i guess i'm not as bothered by those in as much as like we haven't really established a lot about this mysterious entity like yeah. i like the fact that whatever you do get glimpses and stuff like when she sees herself like when the doppelganger sees the real alice she's like oh hi teapot like has no <laughs> recognition Yes, whatsoever yeah. like there's mm -hmm. elements like that where you can and it almost feels like she's kind of like trying to destroy whatever this thing is by like breaking her nose in this way like trying to like oh your whole thing is about emulating but how about if you emulate me like hurting myself which i think is another thing it's just like the weird self-harm element of it right i think it's like it's an, it's not element to like it, i guess it's like my biggest problem with it but mm -hmm. at the same time there's little elements like i love how whenever she does sort of like change elements of her uh the digital version has to like artifact and then so yes. it transforms into the, the mirror. And even like mm -hmm. with the, the element you're talking about with the um, the cam girl comments, I do like the fact that in the earlier parts of the movie, there are a couple, at least of the commenters who are her regular listeners or regular viewers who yeah. are like, hey, like leave her alone a bit. Like when people like harassing her in the comments and stuff like that, they yeah. show like yeah. there's a bit of like more of a respect for like her initial smaller audience. But that as things have grown to the point where this, like, she's a huge sensation, almost number one, it's become all the more, once again, this sort of, like, oh, capitalism has destroyed this thing that was once a fun art that somebody wanted to do. And it's, like, completely destroyed it <laughs> and destroyed the audience into becoming, like, monsters, basically. Exactly. Exactly. And you always hear that about social media. Like, I, I hear that, uh, like, at 10,000 followers is when Twitter becomes unusable. Like, when you have a core group of people who are actually interested in what you have to say it's nice but after a certain point it stops being individual people and it just becomes the public and anybody who's worked with the public before knows how terrible the public is so <laughs> i like it becomes faceless and anonymous and meaner as a result i mean look we're just we're all waiting for blumhouse's curse of the blue check <laughs> a copyright 2022 thomas mariani do not steal um, write it but down it <laughs> yeah but um but yeah I, I i'm curious so how do you feel this kind of works in terms of like the general blumhouse fair because this feels a bit different i would say from like the this isn't quite a purge necessarily <laughs> as it were what, what do you think blumhouse can learn from hopefully maybe like acquiring more movies like this or you would hope you, they would seek more of these out instead of just kind of fitting into like a sort of company thing or doing like more halloween sequels all this other stuff what, what do you think they can learn from maybe giving a movie like this more attention than dumping it on netflix 
Well, for starters, um, you know, not to get in another dig at Jason Blum, but hire female creators, hire creators who have lived the stories that you want to tell. You know, the screenwriter, this was her story. This was, you know, lived experiences at working as a cam girl. This was not um, some random dude who didn't know anything about sex work and decided to make a movie about a cam girl. You know, hire people who can speak to these experiences and have interesting perspectives and have new perspectives because this, I agree, this feels unique for Blumhouse. It's a unique movie. It's very well done. I think just expanding your idea of who is a horror filmmaker will do a lot for you. You know, more creators of color, trans creators, queer creators, indigenous creators, disabled creators, expand your horizons in terms of who you think should be able to tell stories. I completely agree that we would need more of that representation, but at the same time, just on like a selfish level of like, I like watching movies as like a cis white hetero dude, which of course, a great way to start any sentence. Um, but, <laughs> but, but even like from my perspective, like this is just like a really entertaining movie I hadn't seen before. It's a cool, mm -hmm. different thing. That's why I, like, really champion this movie amongst, like, the Blumhouse sort of dreck, as it were. Like, one that I would especially, like, like to highlight because it feels, like, so interesting and unique and especially at digging into certain things about even, like, internet horror. Like, internet horror, like, Blumhouse has dipped into that, well, let's say, the Unfriended movies, mm -hmm. um, which, you you know, take of that what you will, <laughs> depending <laughs> on your perspective on those movies. But, like, so few of those internet horror movies, I think, really dig into true palpable human fears, as much as, like, very baseline ones about, like, oh, your kid's on the internet and then she disappears or whatever. Like, a lot of them kind of dig into that, like, sort of baseline thing. As opposed to, like, mm -hmm. ones like this or not quite horror, but I love Searching, a John Cho movie, which is a way better job of, like, actually exploring what it means to, like, deep dive into the internet or even the we're all going to the World's Fair from earlier this year, which I think is a fascinating horror movie about a subject like that. I think a lot of people fear quote unquote niche stories things that are highly specific and personal and individual but in my experience the more specific a movie is to the one creator telling the story the more specific the more personal the more individual the more unique the more potential it has to tell a story that appeals to everyone if you try mm -hmm. to tell a story that appeals to everyone, you will appeal to no one because you won't say anything. But if a, one person with their story tells what their life has been like, what they have learned, what they have experienced, that is going to appeal to the masses because they we will connect with that person because they are being authentic and they are being truthful and they are talking about things that they know. They're not just trying to appeal to the masses. They're telling this one individual story. Like, I don't want to hear about sex work from people who are not sex workers. And, you know, I don't know if that sounds like a hard sell, like, oh, a horror story from a sex worker. No, that sounds amazing because she can tell me what it's like, what her experiences have been like. And that will tell me more about the human condition than somebody just telling a generic story. You know, the, the, more unique, the more personal, the more specific it is, the more it can appeal to everyone. I that I firmly believe that that's a hill I will die on. Right. I mean, that's the thing where like Blumhouse has even like seen the huge, massive amounts of that with like a, someone like uh, Jordan Peele mm -hmm. with like Get Out, telling that from yeah. a very specific story. That movie made so much fucking money, yes. <laughs> like massive <laughs> amounts of money, because people were just immediately drawn to like it's a great hook, but also has a very specific perspective. That makes it, like, fascinating for, like, anybody to watch. And I think if Cam had been given... I don't know if it would have made Get Out money. But I think it would have gotten a lot more eyes on it than it would have been just, like, dumping it onto Netflix where it's just mm -hmm. kind of languishing. Yeah. And it's a shame that, like, a, a perspective like this isn't given a bit more attention, a bit more clout, a bit more, like, you know, even more money behind it. Like, I know the, the this creative team is now doing their next movie, the um, How to Blow Up a Pipeline, I believe, which just premiered at TIFF recently. Oh, yes. Right, which I've heard very good things about as well. And I'm really mm -hmm. fascinated to see like them like continue to add their own interesting spin. Because that's what, you know, works especially in the horror genre. Horror can be universal if you have like more of this, like you mentioned, a very specific perspective on it. That mm -hmm. like only makes all the more fascinating to where you can draw on like universal things and the specificity. Yes, exactly. I said it a lot less eloquently than you did. But I got <laughs> to the point. <laughs> But anyway, anyway, uh, we've been talking quite a bit about Cam. So final thoughts, Jessica, about Cam. This was my first w time watching it. So I appreciate you finally making me watch it. It's been on my radar for a while, but I just kept putting it off. And I regret that because it's 
uh, incredible. I think everybody should go watch it. Uh, yeah, go watch Cam and enjoy it because it's great. <laughs> With a fair amount of trigger warnings, we should probably say. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, yes, yes fair indeed. amount of those, for sure, on that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely second that. This is definitely a movie ever since it came out, like in late 2018. It's been one that I've championed in terms of like, oh, what's an underrated sort of horror movie? That lot, like, because I've seen all, like, I've seen the purges and the paranormal activities. Thomas, what's an underrated one? Cam, it's mm-hmm. on Netflix right now, and uh, you should give it uh, more support. Like, a lot of great, you know, sort of personal horror uh, elements to it. A uh, great main performance from Madeline Brewer. She definitely mm-hmm. became one of like the people like I will watch anything that she does based yes. on like a performance like this. And also that you know Blumhouse, you know, s- supports more interesting things like this. Halloween's ending. Come on, you got room. <laughs> Come on. That's all we're saying. But anyway, uh, let's go ahead and go to our usual recurring segment on the show, the Double Redo. Double Redo. Double Redo. Double Redo. Double Redo. Double Redo. Double Double Redo. Redo. So the double redo is a segment where um, usually Adam and I uh, will basically present an alternate double feature based around the topic. Uh, so in this case, uh, we have a good and a bad uh, related to uh, Blumhouse. And uh, I have a good and a bad pick. Jessica also has one. Um, I'll start with mine here, um, where my good pick in terms of Blumhouse Productions is Hush, the Mike Flanagan film, which was also a Netflix drop. Um, but, uh, this one at least I think has gotten a bit more attention because Mike Flanagan has become such a name in horror. And, uh, this was, uh, I remember around the time, like he started with like Absentia and like Oculus and I wasn't as huge on those, but I noticed like he was getting a bit better with each step. And then like Ouija Origin of Evil came out and I'm like, oh my God, wow, this is way better than I would have ever expected from the Ouija sequel, prequel, whatever. <laughs> and then this movie really cemented to me like, okay, this dude's great. I can't wait to see more. If you're unaware out there, uh, this is a movie that follows um, a, a writer uh, played by Kate Siegel, who is one of the co-writers and also is Mike Flanagan's partner, um, uh, who is this author who is deaf, has been living on her own in uh, sort of this like wooden area where she only has like one other neighbor that's kind of has to like, you know, drive out a bit in order to get to her. She lives basically in isolation. And uh, while she's out there, a masked uh, murderer slash home invasioner uh, comes around and starts to uh, hunt her, basically. Starts taunting her. And I think it's a very simple story. It's only like 82 minutes long, this movie. But it's packed in so much suspense and genuine horror and great performances from Keith Siegel and also the, the guy who plays the killer, uh, John Gallagher Jr., which blew my fucking mind when I saw this movie. Like, whoa, that guy from like <laughs> Short Term 12 in fucking the newsroom? <laughs> he's like genuinely upsetting and he's great in this movie. Uh, there's a, It's a really great example of like what Mike Flanagan can do, especially with a Blumhouse sort of like lower budget. And mm-hmm. he's only gone on to do great work from here with like the Netflix shows, like The Haunting of Hill House and then Dr. Sleep. Super underrated fucking great movie that no one saw and it's a shame. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, Hush for sure is one of the, like the better ones out there. Like if you're looking for a good spooky time on Netflix, Hush. Really compact, wonderful little horror movie. And then my bad one is a bit more frustrating because uh, there's a lot of talent as well involved in this one, kind of like uh, with Fantasy Island, where it's uh, the Belco experiment, which comes from a script from James Gunn. He'd written quite a while ago, not directed by him, but he wrote it. And a lot of great people like Michael Rooker's also in it, but also like John C. McGinley, John Gallagher Jr. as well. Um, a, a, a bunch of great people who are all employees in this office building. Uh, where they're just going about doing their average, you know, daily tasks, and all of a sudden they hear an intercom speaker go up and say, "Hey, um, we are going to start a manhunt where everybody is going to have to see how many people they can kill, and whoever survives to the end basically gets to, you know, have a higher promotion, essentially." And with that premise and the people involved, um, I was like, "Oh, this sounds like it could be a really interesting, kind of dark, almost maybe comedic in terms of James Gunn's thing, like a dark comedy kind of angle." with it and it's kind of just a, a bore sadly the the gore isn't that interesting they waste a lot of these talented people like the main bad guy is tony goldwyn who's always like usually very reliable as a character actor type and he's mm-hmm. just kind of like slumming it it's very disappointing considering all that could have potentially worked about that movie um that it kind of ends up being you know uh like a bad version of uh, office space mixed with battle royale like the worst possible scenario version of that <laughs> really interesting pitch 
I I have seen Hush. I have not seen the Velcro Experiment, but I do love Hush, so I agree with you on that. Yeah. Flan are you a Flanagan fan? A Flan? I am a Flan. Yeah, fellow Flans here. Flans stick together. Hell like yes. literal Flans do. <laughs> uh, but uh, Jessica, what are your choices? Okay, um, I did not do this on purpose, but my two choices were released right on top of each other. So Fantasy Island came out February 14th, 2020. My choice for the good film came out February 28th, 2020. And my choice for the bad film came out March 13th, 2020. So all of these came out within a month of each other. For my good choice, uh, The Invisible Man, the remake written and directed by Lee Wanell. I'm a huge fan of remakes that are done well. I think a remake has to do something fresh and different with the source material. And this absolutely does that. Um, it is a story about um, a woman, Elis played by Elizabeth Moss, who escapes her abusive partner, uh, played by Oliver Jackson Cohen, who is a big tech developer he has created a suit that makes you invisible so after she escapes him he fakes his own death and begins tormenting her trying to convince her that she's crazy alienate her from her loved ones um, continue abusing her from beyond the grave so to speak even though he is actually alive by using this invisible suit uh, there are a lot of trigger warnings for this movie let's see how long is this movie this is it's 124 minutes just over two hours the first time I watched it, uh, it took me six or seven hours to watch uh, because I kept pausing it because I was so upset. So if you are someone who has experience with domestic violence, intimate part partner violence, um, any kind of abuse, it might be a very difficult watch for you. So if you go in, please be forewarned. But it is so, so brilliantly done. The effects and the use of space are so frightening like it's so often it's elizabeth moss talking to an empty doorway or an empty corner of a room and she does a, a really beautiful job it, i think it handles abuse and ptsd really smartly and really sensitively um it's also just a damn good horror story it's one of my favorite remakes which is saying a lot because i as i said i'm a huge fan of remakes i think some of the best horror movies and some of the best films ever made have been remakes but yeah it's very scary it can be very upsetting if you have lived through things like this so again please use caution um it might take you six or seven hours to watch it like it did with me because i had to keep pausing to catch my breath fantastic fantastic movie that is such a worthy modern telling of you know the classic uh, i think 1933 universal film um but elizabeth moss is fantastic the whole cast is great lee wanell is a modern master and he just does such a good job with this one all right uh my bad choice uh which came out less than two weeks after the invisible man is the hunt um written by damon lindelof and nick hughes directed by craig zobel this one if you recall if you were on social media or watching any kind of news at the time this one was very uh controversial because the log line was conservative americans get hunted for sport so of course people started freaking out saying you know oh, this is anti-conservative this is a you know liberal hollywood trying to make fun of conservatives trying to demonize them when that is not what happens in the movie at all um but you know no surprise people get upset about it a movie before it comes out and they are upset about the wrong things because they haven't actually seen the movie yet but um it stars betty gilpin who is a very talented actress and i think she's very good in this movie and it has some um, some good set pieces i think the opening in particular when we don't really know what's happening we just some people find themselves in a field with this big box and they're supposed to um fend for themselves and fight off these attackers and they don't know what's happening it's a really really smart opening there's one uh would we call her a scream queen i'm not sure but a, a famous horror actress who gets killed off very quickly which i thought was funny it was not quite a psycho scream situation where the lead actress gets killed off but it was still it was it was handled quite well i think but ostensibly this movie is a satire it's supposed to be about how fractured our political landscape is in the united states how much you know, supposedly conservatives and liberals are at each other's throats all the time but it's so the edges are shaved off 
And it takes such care not to come down on a side that any satire is lost. It's completely toothless. Like it refuses to take a political position. It just says, isn't it crazy that we're at each other's throats all the time? Isn't it wacky that Democrats and Republicans hate each other? It just, it, satire has to say something and this movie doesn't say anything. It, it, it's basically just forget your differences, try to get along with everybody else essentially. And it's a really frustrating, really cowardly movie, I think, honestly. I'm, I'm not saying I want it to, you know, demonize a, a group of people and gleefully kill them off. That's not the movie I was hoping for. I, I was just hoping for a smart movie that had something to say other than, hey, isn't it wacky that people don't get along anymore? And it's just, it's a really frustrating watch because it might have had a point but it's just so the edges are so softened so as not to offend anyone that it doesn't actually say anything yeah i have seen both of these um the invisible man i, I agree is great i think that was like one of the last movies i saw before the pandemic hit in the theater and i was like oh man this is like a, a really great example of dealing with anything with like very like triggering subject matter but doing it in a smart way in a genre context and also just the way that they convey like the invisible man is just like not a force that's always like constantly grabbing at you and it's invisible. Like they get to that by the end of the movie, but the earlier scenes were just like, Oh, she has a knife that she put down and then it gets picked up and then dropped. Mm -hmm. Fucking unsettling. Like some of these like scariest shit possible. It's very subtle. Yes. It's very mm -hmm. small. Um, and yeah, I think it's, it's a really great example of, especially, you know, this was a universal monster sort of retool after universal had the infamous dark universe <laughs> fiasco. <laughs> with Tom Cruise and the Mummy, and, like, that movie put me in such a fucking spiral when it came out. It was just like, <laughs> oh my god, is this what they're gonna fucking do with the monsters? Why the f- what, don't do this. Thankfully, that movie didn't do well, and we didn't mm -hmm. get, especially, the version they were planning on doing of The Invisible Man, starring a certain person that I'm glad isn't starring in that fucking movie. Yes. 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 Uh, and um, this, this take, I think, is exactly what I kind of wanted. Like, the whole time I was hearing about the development of the Tom Cruise movie, just like, you guys are have a good relationship with Blumhouse. Why not just like make small character focused movies mm -hmm. about these monsters? And they were like, "Oh shit, why didn't we do that?" <laughs> and they just did it, and it was great. And I hope they do more of those. Like I know yes. there was like what the what are the ones in development? Like wasn't there there was gonna be the Karen Kusama Dracula? Yes. Apart, but oh, I'm still mourning that. that. Yes. Would've been so fucking good. But I think there's like a couple yeah. other ones that kind of had development. The one I want, the one I desperately want, I think could work so well in a modern context. Creature from the Black Lagoon, there's so much there, and they haven't done a fucking creature movie in ages. Like, not since, like, the last of those sequels were the last of, like, the original Universal Monster movies. Mm -hmm. It's like, there's so much there you can mine, for sure. Oh, absolutely. Do it, Blumhouse. Do it. Cowards. <laughs> do it. Um, then, The Hunt, um, I do... I, I have also seen... I didn't hate it. I think mainly on the strength of Betty Gulpin's performance. Mm -hmm. uh, I think she's... Like, there's a whole scene, particularly at, um, like, a convenience store. Where she yeah, has, like, yeah. such a great fucking one-liner uh, after she, like, shoots a guy. It's like, fuck yeah, go Betty Gilpin. I think <laughs> she made that movie at least watchable to me. But I do agree. I think the satire is very flat. It feels kind of like sort of South Park satire in terms of just, like, oh, we're going to kind of address an issue, but we don't really have much of an opinion on it. Besides, everyone's kind of dumb. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's that's what the satire is like. Boy, aren't isn't everybody stupid <laughs> except for our main protagonists? Right, that's it. Yeah, and it, it feels like that all over. I completely agree with that, and it, it's a shame because especially like a lot of fun people are in there. Um, like even a uh, very like spoilers, I guess, whatever for the hunt. Hillary Swank fucking showing up, right? right yeah. Like I did not expect that at all. Like, <laughs> fucking, they have like, and like it's a weird thing where like I think Gilpin is great. The action is so so. And mm -hmm. then the actual satire is, like, so bottom barrel, like, barely doing anything. So it's a real mixed bag of a movie for me. Like I said, I, Betty Gilpin is great. She um, is a really great performer. R.I.P. Glow. I love that show and I miss it. But, yeah, I have very little patience for satire that refuses to go there. Like, if you're going to write a satire, you need to have a point. And if you if you if you don't have a point, why are you wasting everyone's time? That's my issue. That's why I I feel confident putting this in the bad section, even though I'm sure there are less competently made Blumhouse films. This one bothers me the most because there is a lot of potential there, but ultimately it didn't have anything to say other than ah, you guys are all dumb, which is 
it's it just feels very cowardly to me like it's a cop out goes back to one of my favorite quotes from any movie steve martin plane trees and automobiles if you're going to say something have a point it makes it so much more interesting for the listener <laughs> exactly exactly yes for sure but uh, let's go ahead and repeat our titles uh, for everybody in case you might have missed them out there uh for my good pick for this i had a uh, hush and for my bad i had the belco experiment and for my good pick I had The Invisible Man, and for my bad pick, I had The Hunt. Yes, and uh, please submit your own uh, double reduce at our various socials, as we'll uh, get to here, as we're going to wrap up the show, but stay tuned. We're going to do our picking for next week's spooky episode on that. Uh, But we want to thank some people, like Chris Oliver, for the intro and outro music used for our show. Listen to more of his music at chrisoliver.bandcamp.com. Thanks to Christian Thor Lally for our artwork. Uh, Find him at Night of Water on various socials. That's night with a K, underscore of, underscore water. And thank you to our loyal Patreon supporters, patreon.com slash DEDBpod, where for just $1 a month, you all get to uh, vote in polls for episodes uh, that we potentially cover or topics that we do. And um, also you get to listen to bonus podcasts, which in October we're planning on doing quite a fair amount of them. Uh, We have our show On the Edge of Relevance, where we cover modern movies that are either in theaters or streaming. Uh, There should be one for the new Hulu Hellraiser coming out soon we just did our hellraiser episode so it'll be a bit of a, a follow-up to that uh, me and adam will definitely be recording that in the near future and uh, we're playing also doing one for halloween ends we will mourn michael myers in our own way <laughs> um hopefully uh, whenever we're both able to, to see that before the end of the month we'll definitely put that out there and also just another shout out that uh, we always do one at the end of the month like a specific bonus podcast and we're doing a media discussion about uh mike flanagan i think his masterpiece uh midnight mass Mm-hmm. love that fucking miniseries definitely it's recommend so good. that one that's such a great fucking piece of art <gasps> honestly it's so fucking yes. great Adam and I will definitely be talking about that and put that out before the end of the month on the Patreon and uh, just also we wanted to shout out a new patron uh, Marcus Irving who just signed on uh, he's a talk on society regular uh, listen to his uh, show Have a Nice Apodcalypse the Richard Kelly show uh, and he's uh, we really appreciate the dollar Marcus and, of course, we appreciate someone else uh, here. Miss Jessica Scott, thank you so much for being on the show and dealing with behind the scenes, everybody. This episode was cursed. <laughs> we went through so much fucking shit to record this, but we fought, we're so close to the end. Knock on yes. wood, we're going to finish it. So thank you very much, Jessica, for dealing with all of that. And please plug yourself. Where can people find you on the internet? Okay, and thank you so much for having me. It has been a pleasure. Um, you can find me on Twitter at We Who Walk Here. I uh, write on my own site, wehowalkhere.com, uh, slash film, film cred, Daily Grindhouse, Dread Central, a lot of other places, but I share all that along with my podcast appearances and my cosplay pictures and everything else on Twitter at We Who Walk Here. She's a good follow. Would recommend. <laughs> Lots of fun. Thank you. <laughs> uh, but um, for more of our antics, our rinky dink operation, um, you can follow us uh, on Twitter and Facebook at DEDBpod. And also you can submit feedback or double review choices to us, uh, double edge, double bill at gmail.com. I'll spell it out. And uh, for more of me, uh, follow me on Twitter and Letterboxd is at not the who's Tommy. And I also do some writing at uh, both marianitomas.wordpress.com and at film-cred.com. Um, and also follow Adam on Instagram at Atom or Adam. That's A-T-O-M underscore O-R underscore A-D-A-M. He's also Schwanson on Letterbox. Um, and uh, for uh, more of just our you know audio antics, uh, please follow us on Apple Podcasts, Stitch your other podcasting platforms. If you're listening on Talk Film Society, why not listen to all the other great shows on there on the network? Or dig into our archives and our Podbean main feed for like 200 episodes before we even joined Talk Film Society. And everything else, uh, if you aren't able to support us on Patreon, it's cool. We get it. Money can be tight sometimes. The totally free way to help us out is to rate, review, or simply share the show around because it gets us more visibility out. And now uh, we'll be doing our picking for next week, uh, which obviously a bit hard to do, uh, given Adam is not here and present with us. Uh, So uh, basically what we'll be doing here is I have Adam's two choices uh, for the good pick for next week's episode, and I have mine two bad. And I've assigned them between one and ten for each of those. Uh, So Jessica will be picking a number between one and ten for the good choice and the bad choice. And then that gets us, you know, the good and the bad movie cover 
for next week. And we usually have a rule called the Godfather rule with a potential veto in mind, but we're going to suspend that for this week given Adam is not here. It would not be able to do such a thing, not be able to use his veto potentially. Uh, but we'll still be picking our picks for next week's episode, which, you know, to contrast the modern horror of Blumhouse, we'll be going all the way back as we talk about one of the original cinematic icons of horror, Mr. Boris Karloff. Are you a fan, Jessica, of Mr. Karloff and his works? I am a huge fan of Boris Karloff. Recently saw a film of his for the very first time that I would love to talk about sometime, but I'm excited to see if you picked it. So Yes, we will see. Uh, between uh, First, go ahead and pick number between 1 and 10 for Adam's good choices. Four. Okay. Over at number three, uh, Adam had a pick that I have seen and I really love from, interestingly, the director who made the original version of The Invisible Man, as we were talking about earlier, The Old Dark House. <gasps> Yay. I chose Well. That? That's an amazing <laughs> movie. That's not the movie I was talking about, okay. but I'm so excited. <laughs> yes, uh, that, that's a very great movie. Can't wait to talk about that. But over on the other side of things, over at number seven, uh, he had another great universal pick uh, that had uh, collaborated between uh, Karloff and Bela Lugosi with The Black Cat which mm. I also am quite a big fan of. Both of those yes. would be very good. But Absolutely. Old Dark House, all down for it. Now, Jessica, he's a very prolific man, so he's got plenty of bad ones. For my two bad picks, please pick a number between one and ten. Nine. Okay. For uh, number eight, I had one that was I've been fascinated to see because it's got an infamous production to it, uh, because this is a Roger Corman movie that Boris Karloff shot like three days on, and then his footage was spliced in with footage shot by Jack Nicholson, Francis Ford Coppola, other various people who worked in the Corman school. I have The Terror. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very curious to see that just because of the weird fucking production history of it. I'm so fascinated. Absolutely, yeah. Yes, uh, but on the other side of things, um, I had uh, one of the more infamous ones uh, over at number one. I had uh, 1940s The Ape, which you've heard is... <laughs> quite infamously bad as well mm -hmm. yes but uh so the terror and the old dark house all on next edition of double edge devil bill but until then everybody uh just make sure to you know uh give us those tokens and like and subscribe 